they're going to be using Bitcoin before they even realize they're using Bitcoin because it's yeah. just going it's just going to be a point of, to sale terminal and they're exactly. not they're not even going to realize it. Like you yeah. start thinking about like um, the, this Sonoda company. Are you familiar with that one at all? It's, Which one? It's called Sonoda. Oh uh, yeah, I've heard of it. yeah. Yeah. Well, essentially, their their plan is that they're going to set it up so that you can create an account like Fountain that's going to be attached to your utility meter and you'll be able to stream sats in real time mm-hmm. as you're consuming a utility like your electricity or your natural gas or maybe even like your internet or what have you and then so you can pay in real time and then that eliminates a large credit risk to the, the utility companies who typically like you are using their product and not paying them for two three months and sometimes they don't even get paid and delinquency and all that so that takes a huge risk out of them and we'll, we'll cut a lot off of their bottom line and allow them to either offer better services or cheaper prices and then but that that applies like right up to the the generator like because the generator typically will sell electricity into the grid operator and then the grid operators are the ones that manage it and get it at the distribution level to send it into your home so the grid operator would be paying the generator in sats in real time as they're bringing the electricity into the grid from the generator and then at the same time the generators could also be mining bitcoin and then depending on like your your supply demand dynamics that are going on like they'll be able to just turn turn that on and off if they're oversupplying the grid, or if they're undersupplying the grid. So there'll be multiple streams of sats coming in to, to different uh, power assets, and I, this is going to get out of control. And we're not we're not even going to see it coming, like because this is going to be they're they're piloting it piloting it in Ohio like this spring. Yeah. And I think it's going to be incredibly successful. And then before we know it, like it's going to be everywhere, like. Like we're already it's, it's gonna happen this year i mean well at least their, their pilot project that okay. they're building like in a small wow, small controlled situation in ohio yeah they're going to apply it to a few bitcoin miners that are mining on that grid and then expand out from there as as they see fit and as they get more funding to to grow and but this is one of those ones that uh, i think jeff booth had invested in so if he's oh. if he's putting his money behind it it's got a real potential to uh, Ryan, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi. Good. Yeah, this is uh, cool to be here. Good to you're, meet uh, you, man. Yeah, yeah this is, I hadn't. Uh, you're not one of my regular podcasts lists, so I had to go back through your catalog when you uh, <laughs> contacted me for an interview. So, got, yeah. yeah, you've got some pretty good interviews back there through the catalog. Yeah, now I mean, I've been in this space for I don't know, a number of years now, but um, I, I I've been keeping like a low profile, I think, but I, I've been having like. Uh, pretty much every prominent Bitcoiner or technologist or, you know, I mean, it's, I'm trying like to, you know, uh, cover the whole spectrum, like holistically. Uh, but, you know, everything connects to Bitcoin, in my, in my opinion, as you probably know. Oh, yeah. There's a lot to choose from these days. <laughs> Too much content to keep track of it all. So you got a really fascinating background, Ryan. Uh, why don't you just, uh, you know, just kick it off? Um, can you tell my listeners um, a little bit about your background? Um, I mean, the 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 just the title of it, small modular nuclear reactors, is just just mind blowing. Uh, the the vision behind it and and what you're trying to achieve with that. But we can, you know, talk about your vision and what you're trying to achieve. Your 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 intention behind all this. So yeah, give it a go. Thank you. Yeah. So my name is Ryan McLeod. On Twitter, I go by the handle of Nuclear Bitcoiner. I came into the yeah, I came into the nuclear space about eight years ago when I uh, got a position at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories as a laboratory technologist, basically doing lab work that supports various uh, react reactor safety and research projects that are ongoing at CNL. So I'm not myself actually like a nuclear engineer, or electrical engineer, or anything like that. This has just become kind of a hobby that I've embarked upon over the last year or so. Um, And then when I learned about Bitcoin was early 21. And so it was just kind of a good right time, right place, right time kind of situation where as I started to grasp the idea of Bitcoin mining, then the idea of applying it to small modular reactors came up when having conversations with my wife because the facility that I work at, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories, is set to be one of the first uh, demonstration facilities for 
a new type of small modular nuclear reactor that's going to be built in the five megawatt range. And it's one of a number of different small modular reactors that are going to be deploy, uh, demonstrating first of a kind units throughout um, Canada using our existing nuclear power infrastructure. So yeah, once I got the idea, uh, grasp of how Bitcoin mining worked, I thought it was a brilliant idea to apply it to the uh, plans for small modular reactors. And then as I went along, the idea expanded to how can this apply to like the existing reactor fleet to shore up economics where they aren't the best and have been complicating the operating uh, uh, profile of various reactors throughout the United States and Europe. Um, and then, yeah, I put together a team that entered this contest that was put on by the North American Young Generation in Nuclear. It was called Innovation for Nuclear, looking for ideas to support the nuclear power industry, supporting the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, like ending poverty, bringing uh, developing infrastructure, me providing meaningful work, a bunch of good goals that are worth, worth achieving. Um, and then we ended up winning the North American segment of it and got to promote this idea at a international nuclear conference in Japan just in November. And then alongside that, I've been promoting it heavily on Twitter, building up a network with with various other people that are interested in the idea, finding out that there is there is definitely more than me out there, but it is a very niche space in the intersection between nuclear power and Bitcoin mining. But it is it is growing with a lot of attention and especially recently with the uh, the announcement of the uh, the Talon Energy Terra Wolf project very nearing uh, operational status where the uh, the project that they're doing in Pennsylvania building behind the meter at the uh, Susquehanna reactor so that's going to be a very interesting project and then there are other bitcoin miners that are using grids that are heavily used in uh, with nuclear so basically anybody that's mining in Ontario is going to be on 60% nuclear grid Georgia Ohio those are also heavy grids but the first one that i know for sure has applied this idea behind the meter is the the uh, the uh, the Pennsylvania project so i'm looking forward to see more of those sprout up in the future um the announcement we may have just heard from marathon mining working with uh, the united states uh, united arab emirates may be related to the fact that they just completed four large uh, nuclear reactors and they're going to have a lot of capacity that's going to need to find a home for any surplus just to manage their stability and whatnot as we've been seeing the different ways for it to be applied but I've, yeah, I've just become an advocate for nuclear power these days. I've been an ad advocate for Bitcoin mining, just trying to get in front of whatever audiences I can to promote either one of these technologies. Depending on who I'm talking to, it will lean more in towards explaining nuclear or more into explaining Bitcoin. But it's it's been an exciting adventure with me traveling the world several times in the last year to go to conferences and speaking on podcasts. And very exciting and i'm very excited to uh speak with you today and see what indeed, sort of interesting yeah, ideas we discuss yeah say ryan um can we shed some light on or um, can you elucidate like the historical like has anything changed in regard to nuclear i mean as we probably know i mean in the term nuclear or nuclear technology has been so in the last decades or even half more than half a century at least you know since the end of world war ii uh, so stigmatized, so vilified. I mean, can you like, uh, do you have an opinion on that? Like, has it changed or what's the perception? Is the stigma, has the stigmatization been getting worse or, or has it really like the perception of the general public changed? Or? It seems to go through cycles. Like there was period like decades ago, back in the 60s and 70s, where nuclear power was all the rage. Many countries were building out nuclear fleets. That was when uh, Ontario and France and, and Japan like really got their nuclear fleets up and operational and provided providing lots of abundant, reliable electricity. And then there was a period throughout the 80s where, where the interest in nuclear power kind of went down. Chernobyl definitely contributed to that. And then there was many, many countries kind of started to opt out and phase out of nuclear. Um, and then it was starting to begin a resurgence when there was generation three reactors were starting to be proposed. They had modernized safety systems, but there was a problem of when it goes through those cycles of of not maintaining like a consistent supply chain and labor force 
occasionally you will end up like having the industry kind of atrophy and then you have to rebuild a lot of your supply chains over again and you don't have that labor experience from building a fleet of reactors because that was done decades ago so so a lot of that is lost and it's causing delays and cost overruns but that's nothing that can't be overcome with with enough uh, initiative um so yeah so there was a lot of good nuclear initiatives going on in the the early 2000s and then uh, there was momentum coming and then fukushima happened and then that derailed a lot of nuclear power uh momentum and up until probably about the last two years yeah nuclear was kind of out of the news it was on a downswing like most people were seeing that like reactors were being shut down all over the world uh I'm sure a lot of people were paying attention to what was going on in germany like belgians in another country that was shutting down its reactors um and then yeah late 2021 the public sentiment kind of flipped it seems to have uh coincided with extraordinarily high fossil fuel prices and the the promise of variable renewables not being as as good as they had been claimed in the years leading up to where we now find ourselves in a very precarious energy situation all throughout Europe and various other uh, jurisdictions throughout the world because like now with with Germany not depending on nuclear they're using more natural gas and coal which results in them like outbidding the market and then it has second order effects where now you've got other countries that were barely able to afford this these fuels before and now they have to out compete in a market where Germany is just incredibly wealthy and just throws their their weight around and gets whatever they want so it's it's causing a lot of weird effects that aren't directly attrib- attributed to the core of where where it's happening in in Germany but I'm sure like I I believe you've said you're what in Austria yeah mm-hmm. yeah so so you've got like austria's got a weird relationship with nuclear power there used to be a power plant there but now they only have uh, i believe a medical research facility but then you've got countries around you that are all at various stages of nuclear so i, th- I think there's more countries in europe that are leaning towards nuclear than aren't and some of the ones that were considering moving away from nuclear are considering moving back it's a very interesting dynamic all over the place like romania for instance has mm-hmm. can do reactors that have been left incomplete for almost two decades mm-hmm. that finally just received financing to cl- complete their construction. So that will add a lot more to that area. And then, why do you think it. that is that is the case, Ryan? I mean, uh, for for example, in countries like Austria, um, why is that? Is that like fear? Is that like institutions or organizations that are driving the agenda, or uh, you know, spreading f- a fud, or is that you know, s- sort of a you know, whatever agenda is behind? Why is that just I don't know stupidity? Uh, well, the anti-nuclear activism has had a lot of, of clout and money behind them for many decades. And it really is depends on the varying degrees of, of which they can influence internal politics in various countries. Like even though the the Green Party in Germany has a small physical size, they wield a significant amount of influence. So it's it it's various factors like that of, of how well you understand the technology so that you can actually counter the FUD. Because if you are ignorant of the technology and you're only ever exposed to the FUD, just like in Bitcoin, like you you get this very distorted view of the technology that that's frustrating for the people that are trying to promote it and know that it, it's just FUD. And then you have to deal with what is that called the, the Brandolini's law that the dealing uh with with uh yeah false information requires significantly more energy to uh dispel than it does to just say things that aren't exactly true but it seems things are coming around lots of countries are getting on the nuclear bandwagon it's going to take like north america and europe a, a minute to get uh, our legs back under us but uh we'll get there we have the technology we have the supply chains and the capabilities and the know-how and the labor it's just a matter of getting everything realigned and on target but Canada is pursuing a very ambitious nuclear future that's banking on small modular reactors. And then you've got like the South Koreans that are still building uh, like the large like AP, yeah, APR 1400s that are throughout uh, various uh, Middle Eastern and Asian countries. Like Russia is still building nuclear reactors for various countries that are aligned with them. So there's there's no shortage of action in the nuclear field right now. It's just happening more so in different geographies than other but 
But uh, the SMR thing is definitely going to be a race to be whoever can be the first mover to get something on the international markets, whether it be the small micro micro reactors in the like five to 10 megawatt range or the larger ones in like the two to 300 megawatt range. It's the first first movers are going to get a huge advantage of this, especially if you can get your whole fuel supply lines and supply chains lined up behind it and capable of being ready for export within the next decade or so. Wow. So, okay. So before we go into the really fascinating uh, specifics of, um, um, I, I was going to ask you, like, do you think, I mean, if we look back, like what, uh, since when do we have like nuclear reactors, like energy for, um, uh, and nuclear energy 50, 60 years, 70 years or, uh, yeah, the fifties was about okay. when we started with nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Do you think the, I mean, we haven't had really, I mean, as far as I know, I'm a, I'm a layman in this, I'm not an expert, but but we haven't had really uh, maybe a number, uh, like a limited number of, of incidences or accidents or whatever. Would it be, you know, what was that? Um, in, so, in the former Soviet Union, and was it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's there's Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima are the three major sensationalized accidents. Oh, great. But even... Yeah. Combined between those three, yeah, there's there's at most thirty deaths that can be directly attributed to the the accidents. Everything so, yeah, else is all exactly peripheral related. Yeah. yeah. Do you think the the especially through the media or maybe other organizations, especially through the media, have these um cons, you know alleged uh, damages or health damages or deaths or or whatever um, uh, risks? Um, been uh, intentionally exaggerated you know there is definitely the the anti-nuclear movement is apt to over exaggerate the severity of the accidents and and how how dangerous nuclear radiation in fact really is like you have you have to consume irradiated material to have a, a a guaranteed negative effect like we get exposed to more radiation from traveling and eating bananas than you would having like a nuclear reactor in your vicinity. And the events that happen at Chernobyl and Fukushima are, it's, it's impossible for them to happen again. Like first off, Chernobyl was an old reactor design that was poorly managed. And yeah, there's, everyone's kind of seen how that played out. Uh, Fukushima was an easy solution. And like it was something that they had been warned about in the past, and 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 it was not up upgraded sufficiently to manage what happened when the tsunami hit them, and it was just a matter of making sure that they did not lose backup power and backup cooling, which now the measures that are being taken at the Japanese reactors are to build gigantic seawalls and ensure that they're they have yeah plenty of backup cooling. They they'll have backup generators that are situated in a way that they won't be flooded. So the the accidents that have happened have been corrected in such a way that they will not be able to happen again. And then all the new reactor designs, they they learn from past iterations. They they develop more passive safety mechanisms. So rather than than requiring pa like active cooling, should something like a, a power loss happen, the the fuel state will will fail into a, a safe state instead of risking that it's going to continually heating up and then cause something like a hydrogen explosion like what happened at Fukushima but instead it just it'll it'll automatically just cool off and dissipate into the the heat into the the cooling loop and it won't be any major concerns and they won't be operated at high pressures so there's no risk of like uh, like a high, high pressure blowout if if something was to increase increase in pressure rapidly it's just many years of of iterations of of learning learning by doing and we're applying the new technologies and like many of these technologies that we're going to be applying in the next generation of nuclear reactors have have existed and have been proven in laboratory settings over over decades but the reason that they stuck with the the BWR and PWR type of reactors was it was just it was mo made the most economic sense to just pick one design and then just repeat it at at almost every instance that you're building a nuclear reactor there's like a few one-offs here and there of different designs for research reactors and medical reactors but the vast majority of the global reactor fleet is based around the boiled water reactor and the pressurized water reactor designs and then the can do also falls into that criteria except its unique attribute is that it uses uh uses heavy water instead of light water which enables it to use less 
enriched uranium than the typical boiled water reactors use. So it's so they they all have different different trade offs and and different safety mechanisms, and they'll be able to be deployed at different sizes. They'll be able to be built at different scales. It's going to open up a lot bigger array of where we can build nuclear reactors in the in the in the coming generation. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. Thanks for emphasizing those safety mechanism or safety procedures or safety. I don't know what to call it. Technologies. I mean, we have come a long way, right? So we have uh, there is like sufficient um, safety, you know, um, preventive measures that that have been taken care of, right? Whether we're talking about France, that's like heavily. Is that it's France still like heavily nuclear? Oh yeah, France is like ninety five percent nuclear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I've got the yeah. France is sixty eight percent nuclear. Oh wow! About ten percent, about ten percent hydro. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and they also export a lot of that throughout their neighbors in the European Union. So they they're very heavily relied upon, especially in circumstances like Europe finds themselves in right now. And yeah, their their fleet's an interesting one because there was a lot of uh, criticism over the summer because that's when they they. They scale down their fleet and do do their maintenance, but the way that I've heard it analogized before is that the, the French do their maintenance in more like a garage tinker kind of style, where it's just like we we know we don't need them until the winter, so we're just going to pace ourselves through the summer. We'll get there. We know our deadlines. There's no huge rush. But then like the Candu reactor fleet, when one of the reactors goes down, it's like F1 pit stop, where it's just like we know everybody knows exactly where they've got to go. It's timed down to like every within the hour like this project is done and, and they'll get those reactors back up and operational in as quickly as physically possible so it's it's just difference in in culture and and the way that they operate them but everything seems to be operating quite fine for france at the current state in their their reactor fleet and they've got support from a few other countries in the vicinity that are that have their their reactors and it's just it's an interesting dynamic when you just see how how the like the import export port markets for energy start happening in in like a block like Europe, where because one country becomes very heavily dependent on their nuclear, and then they have so much that they import it, then sometimes the neighbors can get kind of lax with their energy policy, and they be like, well, well, we don't need to build and become reliable on our own because we can just we'll just import from the French, we'll just import from from our neighbors. Like it's a similar thing like we have in in Quebec exports a lot in the summer because they have lots of hydro but then because they have lots of electrical heating in the winter then the whole thing flips around and then they're in situations where occasionally they have to import electricity so it's very yeah these grids are an incredibly complicated thing that is takes takes a minute to wrap your head around how how miraculous it is that we can just turn light switches on and it works because when you do start learning about other places in the world, contrasting that where it's like you're, you're lucky if you have electricity at all, let alone reliable electricity in many of these locations. So that's, that's one of the other big benefits that I'm hoping to see SMRs apply to is that uh, there's a lot of jurisdictions that, that it doesn't make economic sense to build a big reactor in like places like all throughout Africa, but it would make sense to build like little 50 megawatt units to start developing a lot of these communities and, and helping the citizens. South America is another big market that would benefit very well from small modular reactors. And like here in Canada, our intention is to build like the very little ones all throughout um, the northern provinces and territories and replace a lot of diesel generation for small communities and, and mining operations. So that'll get a lot of our. Um, a lot of our dependence on on hydrocarbons down and it'll also it'll it'll shift the market so if we're not using as much diesel for power generation then it'll be more available and more affordable for heavy machinery and that sort of industrial applications where it's still going to take an incredibly long time before those are fully like kind of decarbonized in the way that's being envisioned like i i i think so, some of that stuff is a bit of a pipe dream but like we can definitely realistically get uh, hydrocarbons out of electricity production but there's going to be a few industries that that's going to take a take a bit of time and an effort before yeah we can 
have fully electrified like tractors and heavy machinery. Maybe someday. I'm not going to count against it, but I think that's a little bit more far-fetched than at least focusing on the electricity infrastructure. Okay, so... Um, Ryan, what are the costs? I mean, let's let's talk about these small modular. Uh, first of all, could you like as much as you can like explain this in in a way so that a seven year old child can can understand like what what is uh, what's the difference like between a small modular nuclear reactor and the other stuff? I mean, uh, or what is it? What is that? So SMR is like the broad definition is any reactor that's going to be built under. 300 megawatts of electrical capacity. Typically what's been done when, when the large reactors are built, uh, all of the components will be shipped to the site and the and, and it will all be built basically from the ground up where its final destination needs to be. Some parts will be like compiled at, at, at a secondary facility and, and shipped to site. And so there is some modularity with with like common parks and off off the shelf components. But the main difference with SMRs is the main components of the reactors, they're going to be built in a factory-like scenario, similar to how like large aircraft and uh, and ships are built. There's going to be a central facility that builds them, and they're going to be designed in a way that they can be shipped using standard shipping containers to wherever they need to be. Depending on the size, it may take one through five shipping containers to carry it all together, but then... Once it gets to the site, like again, depending on the size and the complexity, if it's a small one, they'll be able to stand it up within a few months and they'll be able to be generating power very quickly compared to like trying to build a new reactor in the gigawatt range from the ground up. Like that takes at least like five years optimistically, 10 years realistically. Um, and then, yeah, and then as as they get si larger, like they're, they're expecting even up to the 300 megawatt ones are still not going to take like much more than two years to fully configure and be operational so that's where the modularity comes in and then the way that these reactors are going to be able to be configured is that so if you have a five megawatt unit like the one that we're going to be built at cnl they've also designed it in a way that it will easily be able to just add on new modules so if you want to build 30 megawatts you build six modules and then when you are doing it in that structure there, the idea is to kind of use some shared infrastructure, like you'll be able to to house like your turbines in the same building instead of building six turbine buildings, or you'll have to have have just one control room instead of six control rooms. So, so, so that will drive down some of the costs uh, in operating these machines. So, so the more scale you get out of them, you can you can lower your operating costs in those ways. And then the other way that they intend to lower the costs is that just when they're Anything that is mass produced, like any technology that m most people are familiar with, like cell phones, televisions, computers, just as more get from produced, you, they get better at building them, they get more efficient, and then just the, over, out, over time, the cost per unit kind of reaches a a minimum, the like the nth per unit minimum. So that's that's going to apply to these SMRs as well. Whereas the first of a kind units are going to be quite costly because they have a lot of uh, front-loaded capital on them because there's going to be all the, the regulatory and licensing process that needs to be gone through. There's all the engineering process and there's going to, there's, there's and a, a few other things that are slipping my mind right now, but, but yeah, once all that upfront capital, it's going to be front-loaded, but then it gets amortized across each sequential unit. So then the more units that they have commitments to build early on, they can spread out the cost of that upfront capital out further and lowering the cost of each sequential unit and absorbing yeah that front loaded cost across uh, a number of units and then eventually yeah just with with efficiency gains and and learning by through experience and possibly just improvements throughout the supply chain uh way that financing is done various things like that they're expecting that like I, roughly the exact numbers the first of a kind for a 10 megawatt unit of like a, a two modules of the one that I'm talking about, the five unit megawatt one, um, they're estimating the first one's going to cost about $200 million. But then they're expecting that by the time they get to about 20 of these things, the cost per unit is going to be like less in the 10, 10 to 20 million range. So it's going to be a lot more cost effective for various other markets. But there needs to be the wealthier markets are going to be the ones that kind of drive the front end of this to, to absorb a lot of that front end cost. But 
then it comes in just they will have the confidence in making that upfront investment, knowing that there is a significant market demand, not only for the reactors themselves, but for the electricity that the, electri- the reactors are going to be generating once they're built in a community. Because you have to consider things like, like when once you've built the reactors, there is a risk that the community isn't going to provide enough load and demand to make the economics of building the asset in the first place viable. So it's so it's a matter of of weighing those different uh, those profiles to ensure that the the investors are going to be able to recoup their investment in a timely fashion, and yeah, mo- ensuring that there's going to be a load sufficient to consume all of the electricity is it's going to be a major economic make or break for a lot of these uh, facilities, especially like depending on what their uh, their financing rates are. Like, is when you're building like eight nine figure uh projects uh six or nine percent interest can make a uh, big difference on the cost of your capital when you're stretching it out over 40 years so any any means to capture as much profit in the early days as possible is incredibly important so that's where i believe the bitcoin miners can come in and really help amplify these uh this technology in doing what it's already capable of doing just helping it be even better well uh there's some a bunch of questions i had in my head now, um that's uh, we have to un- uh, unpack first of all uh w- first of all what do you what kind of obstacles like i mean you you talked about like 200 million is that like the the overall funding nece- the necessary funding investment 200 million or yeah roughly for to get this first five megawatt unit built at canadian nuclear laboratories that's what they're looking at well, okay. it's going to be a double module. This plan, they're going to be build two of them. I mean, I would assume. I mean, it's not much money, to be honest. With you. I mean, no, I know. But, when in the grand scheme, when you see how much money's being thrown around for exactly. like renewables and stuff, and so, so do, don't you see like a, one of the like it must be of a number of countries, wealthy countries, nation states. I mean, you know, you probably know Samson Mao of Gen Three, who is trying yeah. to you know mission this accelerated type of organization. But uh, I want to also have your thoughts and your opinion. Like, how can we like connect that? Like, like you know, uh, like. <laughs> Um, strategically in the course, in the process of accelerating hybrid Bitcoinization in, 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 in a number of, um, you know, not only El Salvador, but like so many other countries that will, uh, you know, follow. Where do you see the obstacles, the challenges? Um, I think the big ones to me personally is yeah, overcoming a lot of the FUD and just the public ignorance of the technology and just that's just education and advocacy takes care of that and then on the other front is overcoming a lot of the the like the political side of things because there are like sometimes when you're dealing with politicians that have made a decision it's hard to get them to reconsider and actually admit that they were wrong and go in the opposite direction uh like it's very lucky for instance like in south korea they had a president that was going to shut down their entire nuclear system and they were just going to scrap everything and they were just and not continue developing and then they got a new president who's just like no we're just going to forget that that guy said anything about nuclear power and we're going back to the way that we were and nuclear north korea is going to be or south korea is going to be a nuclear powered country that's going to help other countries throughout the world develop their nuclear power and it's going quite well for them now um yeah it's mostly like political getting through these regulatory agencies because a lot of the smrs it's it, it is new technology that that isn't covered by a lot of the regulatory systems that are in place right now so there's there's an effort to get that all realigned properly to adapt to this this new future that we're building with many different reactor designs like canada's tried to streamline it as much as possible and even then like the best we can do is is we're looking at 20 27 28 to start building the first of these units but i expect that this is going to be another gradually then suddenly type of scenario where it's like once we finally get past these like really slow moving bureaucratic processes exactly. and shovels are in the ground then then we're off to the races it's it's going to be determined by how much market demand there is for this and if there is a lot of market demand they're going to start flying off the shelves as fast as we can build them so then when when that starts happening then it's making sure that we have the material that we're going to retire, require to do or make sure we have the available fuel make sure that we have the available like brain power and like like engineers and technicians and and people that are going to build these facilities and work at these facilities and all of the different peripheral technologies and facilities that are going to go along with them because these are going to be like not just with bitcoin mining but there's intentions to build um 
a lot of uh, uh, chemical uh, development uh, systems around them, like uh, for making uh, hydrogen, extracting hydrogen just out of water, and then or doing things with uh, ammonia or methane to make more complicated hydrocarbons and make like uh, synthetic fuels so that instead of extracting, like doing uh, fossil fuels the way that we are familiar with, we'll, we'll be able to synthetically develop the similar molecules that we can use in the same way. Like we'll be able to make diesel synthetically. We'll be able to make all, all of these complex hydrocarbons that we're familiar with through various chemical processes the reason that we don't do that at scale right now is because it's incredibly energy intensive and requires a lot of electricity and and heat and capital to do so so until we have the energy infrastructure to back it up like yeah we're not going to see these technologies really flourish at scale but then if they want to reach this future that's being proposed where everything's electrified yeah we're going to need to really see what we're capable of and push these these smr technologies as as fast as as possible so i'd like to see them being built in multiple ju jurisdictions being deployed in multiple jurisdictions because there's 70 designs on the table right now that are being proposed and then it's on top of the like four or five large reactors that are still in common con uh, use these days so there's a lot of potential. I'd love to see as many as possible, at least get the opportunity to get to the first of a kind unit. But economic realities in a market like this kind of puts you in, in a way that you have to kind of lean into like, well, we're going to develop five, six, maybe eight of these reactors. And those are what we're going to go with instead of trying the whole gambit. But I think if we do something like apply Bitcoin mining to developing electricity with these, we we can just have a market available if one of these reactors is built and doesn't fully succeed in what it's claimed to to be able to do and it can just mine mine the bitcoin and it, it can on the side and send that back to the company and get back to the drawing board and maybe they just have to reiterate and come up with a better design or maybe they just start building reactors with the intention of just plugging bitcoin miners in and then just use that as profit to just just self-replicate into the system and then just keep build a reactor profit off of it build another one and then just keep multiplying like that but just the more the more demand we have outside of the bitcoin market right now is is what's driving it but i think we can greatly amplify it as soon as they fully grasp what this technology is capable of of incentivizing within the industry but yeah getting Getting over the politics, the licensing, and the anti-nuclear FUD would be the greatest obstacles to achieve right now. Like we have, we have the capability to do a lot with nuclear power. It's just, yeah, better education, better advocacy. Yeah, you you said uh, gradually, suddenly. I mean, yeah, it was good that you um, explained that. So there's there's, uh, I mean, we could also call it like the tipping point. Or, well, I mean, what kind of countries would you say are potential candidates? Uh, um, I mean, I would literally, I mean, I mean, seriously, I would, I would consider El Salvador because they are with Bukele. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't trust any politician, but. Uh, uh, but uh, Bukele, at least, you know, seems to have a vision in ethos, uh, principles, and 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 he really wants to, you know, advance and and uh, ha and see, uh, you know, El Salvador, his country, what you know, and his and the people prosper and be safe and have abundance of energy of prosperity. Like, uh, and there is a number of Bitcoiners uh, who have written articles or talked about, like, you know, because you know, you go with Bitcoin money, you go with a energy sources right and and where the energy sources then uh, and you have bitcoin uh, you know centers or bitcoin cities <laughs> then surrounding these uh you know um these centers would then you know evolve new uh little small communities uh, small civilizations is that something you can like um you have an opinion about yeah that is that is part of the vision i would love to see like small countries take advantage of this technology el salvador would be a great use case another one that uh was discussed when i was speaking with daniel prince a few weeks ago was uh madera would be an interesting use case for some nuclear uh, small nuclear reactors um 
like right now Poland is definitely showing interest in it. There's a few others. I think uh, Estonia, like a few other random countries throughout Europe are definitely looking into SMRs in various degrees. Um, like China and Russia are pursuing their own designs for their for their all the the people the countries that are involved in their markets. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of of demonstrating them and getting yeah, like really getting interested. It's just it's it's the chicken and egg thing. It's like we have to we have to get all of this like the regulatory stuff and supply chains modernized so that we can get these reactors built. But we're not going to develop all the as much excitement about and interest in the reactors until they've been built and demonstrated, and that's. We're, that's kind of what we've got to overcome. And once once we've got past that hurdle, then I think there's going to be a lot more more markets that open up for for nuclear power. Like they'll they'll have to develop their own like nuclear regulatory frameworks, which I'm sure the the International Atomic Energy Agency will definitely help them with, and they'll get supported by whatever country um, hosts like the original company that's building whatever reactor reactor design. Like there's there's a few company Canadian companies that are proposing the reactor designs, a few American companies, British companies like Rolls Royce is getting into it. I think there's a Swedish company that's got one. I think yeah, there's all all of the big nuclear players are are proposing a varying range of the of the SMR. So it'll it really depend on where where you purchase it from and that'll often dictate like who who you're aligning like your regulatory environment with okay so any any country that decides to build a reactor that's built from canada like canada will help them align their licensing and regulatory and, and help them with all their environmental processes that they would need to go through and yeah there, God, there's so much potential throughout these countries especially south america and africa like when I, when I was at the uh, at the International Youth Nuclear Conference in November, there was a significant contingent of people from African countries. I think there was eight, maybe nine African countries represented that are all showing varying degrees of developing nuclear power infrastructure. Like right now, Egypt is finishing up a, a Russian-made reactor. Um, and then I think like yeah, South Africa is interested. They they already have one nuclear reactor. They're expecting to build build a few more. But then there's like Nigeria, Tanzania, Ghana, Uganda. Like, God, I couldn't name them all. I still still getting to learn Africa a lot more better, especially like like reading stuff like like Alex Gladstein's work and seeing that the poverty that they live through and this they they need a technology like this to help yeah. them just kind yeah. of be independent and on their own. And they could mm -hmm. they could even develop their own companies and their own supply chains like they have there's many countries throughout africa that already have uh well-established uranium mining and refining uh facilities so like they could leverage that and develop even further right into the full supply chain like that would be amazing to see more independence and, and less less dependence on on foreign states and especially ones that are often out for them their own personal interests and exactly yeah yeah Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's one content, I don't know why, but uh, because of the history problem, because of also, you know, what you just mentioned, Alex Gladstein, um, if there's one continent, it's Africa, which I really would wish them, you know, <laughs> to evolve like exponentially, you know, faster uh, uh, with with these SMR um, technologies. Uh, do you think Russia, because you talked about Russia, just uh, you mentioned Russia, uh, do you think that Russia, um, when it comes, to, for example, to what was that? Um, I don't know the the, the the correct terminology, but like um, nuclear waste recycling technology is 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 Russia so advanced? Is it true that Russia is that advanced uh, in in certain aspects or in totality? Uh, yeah, from what I understand, they have a further developed uh, recycling program. I, I I think the French also have a similar. Uh, recycling program and it's basically just a way that they can reprocess spent nuclear fuel to be used in uh, the breeder type of reactors that are capable of like um using using plutonium and like a more mixed uh, solution of uh of your uranium and your other transuranic uh, materials that are at that part of the uh the periodic table so yeah they they are a little further ahead but 
there's many other countries that are developing similar technologies because that is that is going to be one of the selling points of one or two types of the small modular reactors. This is that they're going to be primarily fueled by recycled fuel from the traditional fleets, and it'll basically just by be breaking it into a, a chemical solution and then separating it out the material that they don't want and then concentrating the stuff that they do want and then reforming it into uh, fuel pellets that can be put into the new reactors or actually some of the new reactors are going to be uh, more of a molten salt slurry where it's just instead of the typical like ceramic fuel pellets that we've used in the the boiled water reactors these are the whole fuel is just going to be a slurry of a of a molten salt and then that's what's going to generate the electricity and then that just gets goes through a, a heat exchanger loop and it and passes off the heat that it generates into into a cooling loop and then that's what generates the steam and turns the turbines and then there these reactors also are going to use that molten salt as a way to store heat so actually yeah i got that wrong because there's there's a second cooling loop so it's there's the the reactor molten salt loop, and then there'll be a second molten salt loop that then can be extracted to just store that as heat and keep kept in in chambers, um, or it can be released and run through the uh, the other heat exchanger to convert it into, into steam and, and generate electricity. So they'll have the option. Many of these reactors will have the option to either generate electricity or use the heat for various processes and in industrial processes. Like if if they're doing like um like oil refining requires like very high temperature heat so they'll be able to get that from a nuclear reactor rather than by heating uh coal or natural gas boilers so there there's many different ways that this new generation of nuclear reactors is going to be applied to various industries to just basically get them reduce their their carbon usage and then we can put put whatever their like fuels that they would have been using to a higher order use and do some sort of value add to it instead of just straight burning it into the atmosphere, which like I'm not one of the apocalyptic types that buys into the the narrative that that if we if we don't eliminate carbon usage today that the world's going to end in x number of years so I'm, yeah, more of, uh, I'm, I'm more of I'm more of the I'm more of the like yeah let's yeah, let's not sacrifice millions of people to poverty today for a hypothetical future that may not happen. If because if humans are good at one thing, it's teching our way out of problems that we find ourselves in. We've done it over and over and over again. So I'm I'm confident that we'll we'll figure out a way to get through this one without bringing on the the very slow rolling apocalypse that I hear is coming. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I don't want to start with you know the whole scientific fraud behind it, uh, the, the distorted facts behind it. It just uh, I don't know. It's it's a whole new uh, cesspool of I don't know uh, corruption, scientific fraud, and 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 lies. But anyway, um, so Ryan, um, so the reason I asked because uh, I mean, ha was or or has it been the um, the nuclear waste? Has it been a problem? Is that really uh, has it been really a problem? Like like where to uh, you know dig it, uh, where to bury it, or um, because because if if it's like almost like completely like recyclable, then we don't have nuclear waste, right? I mean, or, or was there never a problem? Was it was it exaggerated the problem? What was what's the status on that? It's definitely an overhyped problem that gets exaggerated by the opponents of of nuclear power. Um, we have ways of dealing with it. There's the, the, the main goal is to build a deep geological retor repository in various countries that have the suitable, um, geological formations was basically caverns that have existed for hundreds of thousands of years and use, using, using nature as your, as your, uh, storage location. And then those locations will be configured into storage facilities that will allow for long-term storage but also constant monitoring and potentially retrieval should they want more of them and then from what i also stand understand the entire global fleet of nuclear waste is a pretty insignificant volume in the grand scheme of things like like Irradiated material does put off significant amount of radiation if it's not shielded and you're standing right near it, but it takes up a very small volume 
and is shielded easily with a few inches of lead. So there's structures that are built to shield from this. There's transportation methods to move it well, very well shielded. Like you wouldn't even you wouldn't even know. You could stand right beside the drums that house this irradiated nuclear fuel uh, with a like a high high precision radiation detector and you wouldn't even know that you were standing right beside nuclear fuel that was just in a reactor just a few years ago and yeah it's it's just it's one of those overhyped things like to to fully see it through to that end where we want to store it in the the deep geological repositories it's it is a bit of a costly endeavor and it's going to take time and and there's going to be transport and there's there are risks involved with all of that but that is why the industry is become very adept at taking risk mitigating measures and everything is is highly monitored like if there is ever anything on the road there isn't anything else on the road at the same time so that everybody's eyes are on one single package waiting for it to get from it where it's coming from to its destination and then nothing else travels in the interim well that until that is registered at its at its final location so like we've got the technology and the capability and the frameworks from like the regulatory bodies to t handle it. It's just a matter of financing it and doing it in a way that educates the public sufficiently enough that they understand that it's not as severe of a issue as they may have been led to believe because the anti-nuclear activists they they can be very aggressive with their rhetoric and and especially if they they see like a project's being built in a location they'll they'll get involved in some theatrical antics to to raise attention to it and like because we're trying to build a like a it's called a near surface disposal facility here at the canadian nuclear laboratories it's it's for like low and mid-level waste it's basically stuff that was was tangentially related to re radioactive material so it's got it's got like it's got liquid on it so it's it's got it's like just small like gloves and mops things like that and they're just basically going to be put in an in an open air pit that that's well monitored but when it was first announced the anti nuclear activists they gathered up a flotilla and came with a bunch of small boats up the Ottawa river to come and park outside the uh the uh, research facility and wave all their banners and make a big show of things and then they got a bunch of attention from from the media and claimed a bunch of things that were not entirely true so then our co comms at cnl had to go into damage control and go in and do interviews and correct all the misunderstandings to make sure that like no we're not just going to dump this here and then let all the water run off into the nearby river. You know, like we have several settling ponds in, in sequence that, that go through that are each sequentially monitored that anything that does end up going into uh, like a natural water body is going to be probably cleaner than it was before it went through our system. Cause we take that much like overabundance of caution to ensure that there is nothing that these complainers can complain about but they still tend to find something to complain about. Yeah. It's, it's like in bitcoin it's just so much misunderstanding or misperception or what do you call it like 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 non education like yeah it needs you know a lot of education and 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 explaining and comprehension problems <laughs> right sometimes it feels almost intentional like i don't know if you've ever dug into stuff like alex devries and the oh, digiconomist yeah. and like he yeah. like he could be told something straight to his face that disproves a claim that he made and he will just move on like it was nothing and still make the exact same claim like fud, he makes the no, yeah, well, he, yeah he makes the energy use per transaction fud and then he in, yeah. in, in a debate with lynn alden she was just like no like lightning's a thing we can theoretically batch millions of transactions into one on-chain transaction what you're saying is has no basis in reality like it may have mm -hmm. years ago but not now like up, update your shit like we need better critics exactly yeah i mean you know it's one thing if it's stupidity or i don't know but it's another thing like follow the fiat money you know like uh, there's so much, I don't know, scientific corruption, even in peer-reviewed journals. I mean, there's even studies on that, like how much, uh, you know, uh, scientific fraud and corruption has been taking place in all those decades. But anyway, it's just this whole cesspool for itself. Um, 
I know you're not an insider within the compartmentalized military industrial technological complex, but aren't you sometimes surprised? I mean, we have, I mean, we have for a fact, like, uh, I mean, we, but the world has like nuclear powered submarines <laughs> and other vehicles, transportation system. I mean, aren't you sometimes surprised we are, we are, it's the year 2023 now, and we, we still don't have nuclear powered transportation vehicles, cars, or whatever, or planes or um, energy facilities. I mean, isn't that like ridiculous? I'm, I'm quite confident that we will see a lot more nuclear powered shipping freighters in the not too distant future. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. pretty certain of that one. Like mm-hmm. it's going to be a while before we have like cars and, and personal vehicles that are nuclear powered. Like the best we can do is that you are going to be taking electricity that's generated by a nearby nuclear reactor. And that's what's powering your, your Tesla. Like fair enough. It's tangential, but it's still kind of, kind of works. Um, Yeah. What is it like? We may start seeing things like like small ranches being able to use like nuclear power, like like small like one two megawatt type of units. Uh, it would be great for for like hospitals. They could use like yeah, use the ra- reactors as backup rather than uh, diesel generators or what what have you. And it would also be more abundant for than just the hospital. Be able to power like a few blocks around the hospital, so it'd be like. A, a gathering point should there ever be like a major emergency or shutdown. Um, yeah, airplanes, I don't know. That'll be an interesting one. I think that's going to be a while, but definitely, definitely we're going to see it on the seas. Like one of the teams that we competed against at the uh, IYNC, because it was, it was six teams pr- promoting different uh, innovations. There was two, two related to robots. One was more just education and advocacy and then another one was um, was preparing and retrofitting ports to be capable of receiving nuclear powered freighters because the the complications are like the military they live in their own like rules and regulations like the civilian world nuclear power and nuclear powered vehicles is is whole different regulatory regime that would have to monitor that and you would have to make sure that everything is aligned properly between the different countries that are receiving it so like it might it might just start out with only like one or two or three countries just kind of in their own small network and then as more countries add the capability the network grows and then as we know with as networks grow then you have a lot more optionality with how these things move around and it the supply chains get a lot more sophisticated and it's going to get a lot more interesting because we'll be potentially shipping small nuclear reactors on nuclear powered freighters to final destinations where they might be building new nuclear powered freighters and new nuclear reactors like well, it, it could become very self-perpetuating once we get yeah. some momentum behind it now i've been thinking a lot about this because i mean let's just you know, just for the for the sake of it just let's say you know we didn't have we wouldn't have all this you know uh national security circus the military industrial complex the the uh, to be honest with the co- corrupted you know fraudulent patent system i mean what if we had like openly accessible on a technological level, like you know, interdisciplinary cooperation. I mean, we could we could learn so much, and we could innovate and prosper and and thrive in with an exponential rate of speed. I mean, this is what I was getting to. You know, yes, but you're you're thinking like a Bitcoiner. The, <laughs> what, you, what you described is the problem of of just is fiat thinking. It's that's what causes this all, all these hangups. Like open source nuclear technology would be amazing. That would be, it would allow for far more collaboration, far more development, and it would be, and and it would be able to keep a better handle on on things getting out of hand because there would be more people paying attention to everything that's going on. There, there, there would I, I think that would develop a lot more trust within the system rather than this way that we're doing it. We're like, well, what are the Russians refining over there? Are the how much are they enriching it? Or are they selling uranium to the Iranians or the North Koreans? Yeah. And, and like, it's all everything's like suspicion and subterfuge like just open this up and let go of this stupid like fiat competitive mindset like it's the same thing Thank just you. on the <laughs> on the subsidy levels yeah like when, when when everyone's fighting for the same subsidies that's why we have advocates of the variable renewables uh, fighting with the fossil fuels fighting with the nuclear everyone's fighting to get a better seat 
at getting like better government rates for loans for yeah. these yeah. subsidies to build these projects. Yeah. And now <laughs> as we're seeing, because like we pay attention through the money and it seems like they're the, the people in the renewable space got a little bit ahead of their skis. Now things are getting a lot more expensive. They were on this trend where it's like, Oh, solar panels and windmills, it's getting less expensive. Not anymore. Now the cost of your electricity is going up. The cost of your raw materials is going up. The cost of your cost of your financing, your cost of capital is going up. It changes a lot of the dynamics when uh, you're dependent and already like hanging by your margins are hanging by a thread in those in those cases. So like a lot of instances when they'll front load a lot of subsidies on building these large wind and solar projects, they'll that'll only apply for a period like half of the life of these projects. So then as soon as the subsidies run up, that's when ownership gets transferred to a local owner instead of some large conglomerate that was just milking the subsidies. And then that local owner now has the back end lifetime of these this project. That's when it starts needing maintenance, starts needing replacement, and starts getting all of those superfluous costs that uh, it it's great when it seems like it's free electricity just coming from the weather, but then when you need to maintain these things and replace these things and you don't have the same level of subsidies and cheap capital available to you, it's a whole different ball game. Like at least when you're talking in the, the nuclear world, like we're aware we're thinking in 60, 80 year time frames. Like before a project gets greenlit, you have to confidently be able to say like where you're getting your fuel from, uh, what your fuel cycles are going to look like, your um, your exclusion zones, yeah, and then on your operating plans, maintenance plans, and then at the back end, whether you're going to apply for like a life extension or if you want to decommission it, and then you have to have your waste all planned out. So there's a lot of variables that, that need to be in play. And like that's one of the main factors that makes nuclear so damn expensive is that every thing from cradle to grave has to be accounted for before we can move ahead with these projects that's yeah which is not something that many of the competitive technologies have to share so it's overcoming those burdens has been a bit of a hurdle and that's one of the reasons why cost and time overruns with some of the recent projects if you're familiar at all with the uh, reactors being built in georgia or the one being built in the uk right now it's like yeah they're way over budget way over time and it's grading a like the the anti nuclear people are are kind of like cheering it on and giving us oh see we told you so but then you look across the world at the UAE and they just stood up four giant reactors in like eight years on budget and so it's it can be done it just it's a matter of the will to do so like the more political alignment behind the industry the the better and more efficient will be so like here in Canada it's very interesting because up until recently there was kind of little to no support for nuclear from the liberal government they weren't outright against it although our environment minister is a former anti-nuclear advocate and he was one of the head cheerleaders is for the for the uh not refurbishing and instead shutting down and decommissioning the two gentilly reactors that exist in quebec um so so there's him he's the environment minister but then on the other side we have the labor minister who is very very pro nuclear because he's like it provides good jobs good union jobs yeah that's that's exactly where his mind is at so there's there's very mixed feelings within the cabinet but then recently it seems that as more public sentiment has has become positive towards nuclear the liberal government has kind of been more opening up to supporting it they're they're um they're making claims that they're going to f help finance some of these new first of a kind reactors, which is great because helps get that get them off their feet. But it creates this interesting dynamic because the opposition party and the conservatives, they their leadership had been starting to push for more involvement in Canadian nuclear power, while the Liberals were still kind of not quite there. So now it's creating this dynamic where where now they're going to start trying to out nuclear each other. We've got the liberals that are like, yeah, we're going to pledge billion dollars to build this nuclear reactor. And then if the conservatives are just like, well, we're going to pledge to build all of the nuclear reactors and really develop this technology and push Canada to the leadership role where it should be is yeah. Talking about Canada these days is, is, is an interesting topic. Like I was going back through your catalog and listened to a few of the expatriates that you had interviewed that uh, escaped the madness and, like just last 
well, this week is ongoing, the one-year anniversary of when uh, a bunch of upset people that were not, just wanted to be left alone, decided to drive to Ottawa and squat on the Prime Minister's front porch. And <laughs> yeah, it was exciting times. People are active. At least people are taking human action. I love that. Oh. Yeah, Canada is an interesting place these days. Mm -hmm. So, Ryan, to wrap this up, before I, mean, I have a final question. I mean, what would you do? Um, let's just say, for the sake of simplicity, let's take the example of El Salvador, and let's just really uh, assume or uh, hypothesize that Bukele is really a super visionary man. He really wants, you know, the good for 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 El Salvador and its people and everybody who's coming to El Salvador and to, uh, to create abundance, prosperity. Um, how would you connect? How would you? I mean, if you were to advise Bukele, I mean, to you know, the mission to accelerate hybrid organization, and then you know, the, you got El Salvador like one of the first countries maybe to go debt free with its Bitcoin and volcano bonds, and and investment, you know, entrepreneurs are coming, expats are coming back. So, um, how would you advise Bukele and his team, you know, to? Maybe, you know, uh, deploy uh, uh, these SMRs, these uh, small uh, modular uh, reactors. Um, is there, is like, is a big, a big vision, like uh, how you would uh, approach that? I've had a few ideas that I've wanted to discuss with, with some of the people involved down there. But what I'm thinking, like in the short term, develop the assets that they have available to them. They definitely take these volcano bond investments and take whatever volcanoes that you have available to develop the geothermal plants on, use the, the Bitcoin mining to finance them and ensure that they have a load. If you've got nearby communities, build out whatever transmission you need. But then in the the, the longer term, when we start seeing the these react types of reactors commercially available, I'm thinking more of the line of instead of having a large network of, of high trans, high voltage transmission lines crisscrossing across the country. Just leave the geothermal mines for Bitcoin mining and anything in the local vicinity and then take those proceeds and profits and take that, then invest them into building nuclear power assets that can be located where your population centers are, where your industrial centers are, and then you can start building around them. Like that would be an ideal thing possibly for, for the Bitcoin city. Like this sounds like this is going to be like a like 10 plus year project. So that fits in with the time frame that they could have a small modular reactor built in that jurisdiction in the time frames that they could be looking at. And then, yeah, if it was financed by Bitcoin mining off the volcanoes, that would be a pretty, pretty cool story to tell. Like there's so many different ways that you can do it. And that's one of the, one of the ways that I think El Salvador could pull that off. And then like, they'd be in a brilliant example. To so many other places that'll like, I think once, once a few places have shown that this combination is really successful, I, I think it's just going to take off. Like, even though like it does have the, the dynamics of like mining going difficulty going up and then some people are less competitive, I think nuclear power is going to take a substantial chunk of the mining profits to the point where like the only other miners that are going to be competitive with it are the ones that have basically free electricity that they're generating from some sort of stranded source. Like, because nuclear yeah, at the right scale can drive electricity prices down, like at at, le at least at the wholesale rate down to like two, three cents kilowatt hour, which is incredibly low. And we can get that anywhere and everywhere. It's just a matter of matter of willpower, really, and getting the right people behind this idea. So that's what I'm trying to influence in my spare time on the side from my normal day to day job and talk to the right people and right scientists that are making like uh, making hybrid energy system models and just trying to incorporate a Bitcoin variable into those models just to see what they can spit up and make make better cases for profitability of these uh, these assets in far flung places. Because yeah, I would I want to see this in El Salvador. I want to I want to go back. I went there once for adopting Bitcoin. It was an amazing time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm already gung ho to go back. Bring the whole family this time. Would you uh, would you would you even consider staying there like permanently? Like is that there, were, there was a minute there where it was uh, an option on the table where we were like, well, it's one of those places to consider if uh Canada does get too hot, but like uh we 
and you we waited it out. You know, Brian. I mean, your expertise, people like you. I mean, you would be needed. These are the engineers, the inventors, the researchers, the, the the brains. You know, I mean, this is what I would do if I were Spokil. I was just gonna. I mean, fantastic idea which you just laid out. But on top of that, I would, if I was Bukia, I was like, I would like build a parallel civilization over there, like bringing the best brains, the brightest minds, would it be inventors, engineers, scientists, researchers like yourself? I mean, uh, I would just, you know, uh, create what, what Jeff Booth is constantly talking about, you know, like from within the hyper Bitcoinized system and, and thinking and ethos, like create the abundance, you know? I think the incentives are just going to drive exactly what you said. It's just what as as more of these endeavors are undertaken, it's going to attract the best and the brightest. And then that's going to create a feedback loop where other places are going to see it working. And then it's just going to it's just going to gradually then suddenly like, like that was it's the perfect statement. Like I love Preston Pish's work, but that is that is the perfect way to frame it or no that. That's Parker Lewis, I think. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. There's so many friggin' people in my head, yeah. but yeah, whoever, whichever one of those guys that wrote that that series, it's friggin' brilliant because it applies to so many, so many things. Mm -hmm. But I just think the the incentives will take it. And like having read, uh, I don't know, are you familiar with this Luke Broyles guy that's been on Twitter the last few days? He just he he tweeted something out about that we will have more in common with citizens in the roman era than we will from yeah, somebody yeah, like 100 right, years ago right, like yeah. that whole like framing of things that he goes just like mm -hmm. this guy's got a huge brain and like he's up there with like jason lowry's level of thinking on this stuff and mm -hmm. it's like if if what they are say is is even a one percent chance of coming true just get some bitcoin just just in case it catches on really <laughs> like, it's like uh, I don't even try to to sell on like the big spiels anymore with the people I'm trying to orange pill. I'm just like, just get a little bit, just figure out how to use it, know how to use it before you're in a situation where you're forced to learn how to use it. Cause then that's when you're vulnerable to be taken advantage of by all the shit coiners and scams yeah. out there. Yeah. yeah. Just, just, yeah. Incite or, or inspire people to just to do it. Because I think even for a lot of Bitcoin, I think, uh, it's beyond imagination comprehension what is literally possible you know in the very near future I, and I, I i truly trust in 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 that effect you know that it will happen very suddenly you know you know maybe you know in the next years extremely like exhaustingly slow and but then all of a sudden there will come a tipping point and it will just take off like a chain reaction the process on every level we can think of you know but yeah oh. Yeah, it's beautiful. Like it's like Bitcoin's just existence has proven that several computer problems that were claimed to be impossible, yeah, have been solved. So it's just what else are, is do we think is impossible that we can solve? And there's yeah. a lot of I mean, a lot look, of brains on the problem now. Fourteen years into Bitcoin, I mean, just amazing, right? I mean, isn't that isn't that like an S curvature on every level from you uh -oh. know innovation well, development and whatever a recent one i was listening to was just like no it's just going to be a j curve like there's no going to be tapering off like this this goes up forever like <laughs> it's everything there is and ever will be divided by 21 million like everything that has a monetary premium above its utility value is going to be swallowed in by this yeah. black hole like it's yeah it's inevitable. And then people it is the don't scarcest. even understand the power of purchasing power. This is what I'm saying. You know, people are so like it's so rooted this fiat thinking, this dollar, whatever euro conversion. It just you know we need to really comprehend this in in terms of purchasing power. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are going to be freaked out that like oh the prices of things are going to go down in terms of the money that I hold. Like it's it's such a foreign concept because of decades of inflation. Everyone's used to things going getting more expensive and you, yeah it's you talk to people and you, you realize that there is such a lack of money literacy like it's not like there'll, there'll be like financial literacy like how to earn money how to spend money how to invest money but it's nobody really understands the money itself that that is what we need to educate people on like now but now at least we have something that we can contrast it with we can say like this is a type of money. This is a type of money. And this is technologically why this type of money is superior to this type of money. Right. But before yeah. you're just you're 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 a fish in water that doesn't understand that you're in water. Like it's that mm -hmm. whole concept. Like this you, is what yeah. I think what Jeff Wood is trying to communicate is like you know we are, the people even the most the, the most intelligent people out there in space. You know we're talking about. Um, 
uh, like I don't know, I don't want to name them, but you know, they're so they're so rooted in their own you know fiat system th whatever you know system. Uh, it's it's like the matrix, but <laughs> they, they can't get out of it. You know, the, it's like the. I don't know. It's it's a very 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 uh, indoctrinated way of, of of thinking or imagining even things. You know. Well, yeah, it was interesting because there's there's been a few examples of of really smart people coming out against Bitcoin lately. Like Michael Schellenberger was one. Mm -hmm. That Peter Zihan guy. Like we know Jamie Dimon hates it, but like he just proved on um, in front of the whole world that he's an idiot that can't do math or he knows and he's just intentionally being deceptive and right. facetious. Right. I thought, what was the other one? I, but then, like, you see different contrasting examples, like, because uh, what was it? Michael Schellenberger was interviewed on Pomp's podcast. Mm -hmm. Like, he was very antagonistic, and he was just like, this is a stupid Ponzi scheme, and I'm actually going to fight against Unbelievable. it. Unbelievable. Like, equivalent to Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. But then I listened to a recent one where uh, Pomp had on Constantine Kissin, a funny comedian, had some a good, uh, good speech about woke culture recently but he was going on he's like i don't understand much about bitcoin i kind of side with the guys who think it's a ponzi scheme but at least he was like he was open to the discussion okay. and, and and having pomp kind of explain like why that's not quite the way that it you should understand it and it's a lot bigger than that and just but you just see anybody that just sees it at the price at the exchange value that if, if they don't see beyond that yeah you 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 can you can tell immediately when you're talking to a bitcoiner you know you're talking to someone that sees beyond the price like we can get into this like we can have whole conversations without even really discussing bitcoin's price or even just bitcoin in general it's just all the peripheral things that it, it touches is yeah once you once you see the world through the money it everything takes on a whole different uh perspective especially history yeah everything makes more sense all yeah. through history when you when you see the money overlaid over top of it exactly it's fascinating. you know it always uh, depending i mean it doesn't really matter what topic or or content it just sometimes people need time you know sometimes you have to mature or you have to plant the seed and it's it's i mean from my experience it's just you know i don't know it's uh or the pain point hasn't been reached or the open-mindedness is not there or whatever trigger or key or portal needs to open <laughs> Whether you do it in sober or psychedelics, I don't know what. But uh, sometimes I'm really thinking maybe people should, you know, take some psychedelics and open up their mind and their, because people are not stupid. You know, most people are not stupid. You know, they're just, uh, yeah, I don't know, dogmatized, indoctrinated, or brainwashed, or just very, you know. very well, very well programmed. Have you ever like, yeah, had a situation where you're speaking to somebody and you're explaining to things like kind of like outside the matrix ideas, and then. It seems like you're starting to break through and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's interesting. I see, kind of see where you're coming from. And then the next time you speak to them, it's like they just had like a memory reset. <laughs> Everything's been wiped. It's like, okay, you, oh, clearly you just went and got oh, your okay. updates from CNN or whatever legacy right, right. media you want to... Yeah, you know, I always, I always talk. We always talk to uh, with my girlfriend. We have a two year old daughter, by the way, and I um, mean, you know, we we do everything for our daughter. It's like, for people, but I'm like, we sometimes we're like, you know, we got to give it to the system. They they've done a brilliant job, right? I mean, come on, mm -hmm. it, it, they've done a brilliant job brainwashing generations after generations with whatever so highly sophisticated, you know, psyops. Uh, whatever you know false flags media the whole you know the whole bunch of interconnected systems that are deeply accessible of corruption and and control and power structures anyway I, i'm just going off the <laughs> anyway. no, just bad incentives yeah. bad incentives that need to be repl replaced with good incentives and hopefully we can steer the ship in the right direction but we all have to be on the understanding that it's not just going to happen like all of like the bitcoiners that are upset that el salvador is just not at the flick of a switch just everyone everywhere's accepting bitcoin like it's a process like it's just this doesn't happen overnight we're not going to get to hyper bitcoinization just within the, like the next few years maybe the next few decades but again it'll just be one of those things where it's just going to creep in and we're not even going to realize it like from what i'm hearing the tools that are being made available like for for point of sale and just just ease of use for the every average person and the user experience they're going to be using bitcoin before they even realize they're using bitcoin because it's yeah. just going it's just going to be a point of, to sale terminal and they're not they're not even going to realize it like you yeah. start thinking about like um the, this sonoda company are you familiar with that one at all it's Which one it's called sonoda Oh uh, yeah, heard of it. yeah. Yeah. Well, essentially their their plan is that they're going to set it up so that you can create an account like Fountain that's going to be attached to your utility meter and you'll be able to stream sats in real time 
mm-hmm. as you're consuming a utility like your electricity or your natural gas or fuck, maybe even like your internet or what have you and then so you can pay in real time and then that eliminates a large credit risk to the, the utility companies who typically like you're using their product and not paying them for two three months and sometimes they don't even get paid and delinquency and all that so that takes a huge risk out of them and we'll, we'll cut a lot off of their bottom line and allow them to either offer better services or cheaper prices and then but that that applies like right up to the the generator like because the generator typically will sell electricity into the grid operator and then the grid operators are the ones that manage it and get it at the distribution level to send it into your home. So if the grid operator would be paying the generator in sats in real time as they're bringing the electricity into the grid from the generator. And then at the same time, the generators could also be mining Bitcoin and then depending on like your your supply demand dynamics that are going on, like they'll be able to just turn turn that on and off if they're oversupplying the grid, or if they're undersupplying the grid. So there'll be multiple streams of sats coming in to, to different uh, power assets, and I, this is going to get out of control. Wow. And we're not we're not even going to see it coming, like because this is going to be they're they're piloting it piloting it in Ohio like this spring, yeah. And I think it's going to be incredibly successful. And then before we know it, like it's going to be everywhere, like. Like we're already it's going to happen this year i mean well at least their their pilot project that okay. they're building like in a small wow, small controlled situation in ohio yeah they're going to apply it to a few bitcoin miners that are mining on that grid and then expand out from there as as they see fit and as they get more funding to to grow and but this is one of those ones that uh, i think jeff booth had invested in so if he's oh. if he's putting his money behind it it's this got a real e- potential to yeah. uh, with this ego death stuff. whatever uh, ego capital. death capital yeah, yeah. Uh, wow that's amazing cool gee I gotta take a, a closer look at that yeah mm-hmm. yeah we, we should keep that on the radar Jesus that's that's that would be amazing yeah well there's so many things and then just being able to purchase things like like buy, you can then buy things through your supply chain like if you set up like lightning channels between companies like right like the entire fiat system like once once you start seeing and thinking in bitcoin and lightning the, the entire fiat banking system it is just it, it's it, it, it already it already feels like an antique yeah yeah <laughs> like like i tried and, to know, the good thing is again you know as buckminster full of what is the name follow <laughs> he said you know we're just we're just creating new systems we're, we're creating something new and making the old obsolete that's the beautiful part of it because you don't we don't need to fight the system that's the beauty of it you know yeah but the system will fight its own obsolescence because yeah. there's too many too many people that are dependent upon it but i think humanity will be a lot freer once we relieve ourselves of these institutions that have been dragging us down for a while like yeah. everything's gross like fiat poisons everything art architecture engineering yeah beyond imagination stuff. i mean every level every layer you can think of it's been so i mean sometimes beyond words anyway so ryan uh i'm really yeah. really am so grateful for you know that you shared your your thoughts your perspective your vision is there anything we left out or is there anything important or you want to give like any anything like did you write articles are there any books you can recommend or documentaries for people to you know get a little bit into that in, into this topic well as for stuff we didn't cover uh, there's probably but there's there's a lot of different tangents to, to go off on this yeah i probably discussed different things and throughout the different podcasts i've done um books and stuff like um, I always suggest people read if like you want to learn more about energy infrastructure, anything by Vaclav Smil and uh, Meredith Angwin's book on shorting the grid. Those are two must reads to understand that whole system uh, for nuclear power in general. There's a few good podcasts that I listen to. One's called uh, Decoupled uh, and then Titans of Nuclear and Nuclear Barbarians are, th- are three really, really good ones that are very nuclear focused. There's actually a new one that has recently come out that uh, CNL is actually doing itself um god what the hell is it even called i don't remember what it's even called but cnl has their own podcast okay well, and okay. i'm i'm bugging them mm-hmm. i'm bugging them to uh to do an interview with me because most of my, my interviews that i've done are with bitcoiners so i'm explaining all the nuclear side to them so i want to get i want to get talking to more nuclear people to pitch the idea of bitcoin to them like yeah like when i was at when i was at the 
Japan conference. Like I was meeting all kinds of people from around the world in the nuclear space. So pitching Bitcoin to them, it was like I was explaining Bitcoin differently to the guy from Russia, to the guy from Japan, to the to the guys from Africa, to the guys from South America. Like they all, they, it all took a different angle to approach it from. And like most of them was like the Japanese was like, yeah, your your debt to GDP ratio is getting a little high. You guys might want to uh, be careful with that debt and find a way to uh, refinance that. And then with the African guys, it was like, oh uh, yeah, you guys might want to find a way to get out from underneath that that Af- that that French franc. And with the Russian guy, you get talking about like sanctions on civilians that aren't that don't have anything to do with the events going on in Ukraine. So it's very good and interesting stuff in in the industry. And I I just want to keep talking with more people. You can follow me on uh, Twitter as Nuclear Bitcoiner. Oh, yeah, just keep an eye on the space. There's very, very exciting near-term future for nuclear power coming out through through yeah. the next decade. I will very excited. Be, yeah, be uh, you know keeping an eye on you <laughs> and on future podcasts and talks or whatever wherever you go. Not you know as you said, not not only Bitcoin uh, podcasts or discussions or talks or, or whatever publications. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Ryan, and hope to you know talk to you soon in the very near future. And uh, I'll put everything in the show notes, uh, which uh, what you you know um, shared with us. And yeah, cool. Yeah, that was great. I had a lot of fun with that. Thanks. Love it. <laughs> okay, Ryan, have a good day. Talk you soon. Bye bye. Bye.